Father, we thank you for all of your gifts to us, but most especially for the gift of your Son, Jesus. And we pray that as we seek to learn more of the life and teachings of your Son during his earthly ministry, that you would open our minds and hearts. May your Spirit direct us, protect us from wrong understanding, but guide us to a greater knowledge of you and a greater experience of your love and direction in our life. We ask for all of this in the name of Jesus, whom we love. I mentioned a little while ago that the outline has changed. It may change again before I'm done. I had said that this week we're going to look at Jesus and the Synoptic Gospels and next week and the Gospel of John. I decided rather than use the source as the key, I'm going to stick with the, the times in Jesus' life and then use that as the basis to look at not only his life but also his teaching as well. So this week we are going to look at the childhood and start of ministry because there's some aspects of Jesus' birth, his childhood, and the beginning of his ministry, especially, for instance, John the Baptist, and the fact that Jesus was baptized by John, and then the temptation in the wilderness, those things which were either birth, infancy, childhood, or the, up to the start of the ministry, which his ministry really started after his baptism and after the temptation in the wilderness. That's the best way I decided, as I was studying this week, to get into the content for his teaching as well. And so for the most part, we're going to be doing that. Next week, we will look at the gospel of the kingdom of God, because kingdom of God was the, the thing Jesus talked about more than anything else. That was the, the primary topic in most of his sermons and talks, is the kingdom of God. And so we'll use that as a focal point. Then the ministries of Jesus. In that regard, we will look at some of the big time, time uh, uh, sections of Jesus' life, but especially we will look at his, his ministries of preaching and teaching of uh, healing from disease and driving out demons and what he taught surrounding that. And then relationships, the relationship of Jesus to the Father, of Jesus to his followers, and therefore of the followers to the Father. That, that, that grouping of relationships. And then week seven, we will look at rejection, why it is that Jesus was rejected by the religious authorities and, and most of the society of his day, and at the last days of his life, particularly the Passion, uh, 40, at least 40% of all the gospel accounts have to do with the last seven days of Jesus' life. So obviously there's a lot of, a lot of stuff there. And then uh, week eight, the first hour, we will deal with the consequences of the earthly ministry of Jesus. That is um, sin and its remedy. Why it is that Jesus came to earth for us. Um, so that our sin would find a cure in the nature and person of Jesus. All right? And then the second half, we will do the final exam. Again, I recommend you study for the exam and take it even if you're not doing this for credit because I think it's an advantage to you. You will learn more if you do that, and it really isn't hard. It's just a matter of doing it, okay? All right, um, any questions about that? So this is a different schedule. Even some of the topics that are the same have been moving different days. The reading schedule doesn't change, but if you'd like to just know what the topic is for the week, again, the reading's the same by the week, uh, but you can either pick up a copy there or go to the website for that. All right, we've used this map several times. I was very pleased. Joanne told me she was reading her Bible and that this, this map left to her mind. She actually could picture where these places are, and that's great. <laughs> that's what we want for all of us, is that we have a sense of the geography because that gives us, a, 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 anchors us in the reality that this was a real time in a real place and that these are real people. This is not Grimm's fairy tales we're talking about here. This really happened. And these people are real people. And having a sense of the geography gives us, I believe, an extra anchor for the reality and the historicity of the life of Jesus and the church. Um, of course, this is Judea and Samaria. This was the old northern and southern kingdom. Here is Jerusalem with the Mount of Olives just outside the walls. Um, you get Bethlehem, which we're going to talk about today. Bethany, which is we'll get to later. That's where Mary and Martha and Lazarus live, very near Jerusalem. Um, and then up here in Galilee, where Jesus spent most of his ministry. Nazareth, where he grew up. Um, Capernaum, right here on the northeastern shore, or northwestern shore, excuse me, is where he sort of established his home and base of operations during his, his years of ministry. So we're going to get into um, the particularly some of the Nazareth and Bethlehem kinds of stuff today because we do want to start out today talking about the childhood and uh, childhood of Jesus and the start of his ministry. I've talked about this quite a bit in different classes, 
But we have to start, when we talk about the birth of Jesus, we have to start with the messianic expectation that existed in Israel before Jesus came. Very simply, the messianic expectation goes back to God's covenant promise to King David. You could argue that it goes all the way back to Abraham. And the fact that God promised Abraham that he would have a covenant with him and his descendants, his ancestors, that he would be the father of many nations. You could talk about the fact that he said all nations will be blessed through you if you're in our Pentateuch class. I emphasize that all the time, that when God established his covenant with Abraham, then renewed it with Abraham's son Isaac, and then renewed it again with Isaac's son Jacob, every time Jesus says, or God says, and all the nations of the earth will be blessed through you. So it's not just Abraham and his descendants, it's everybody. Well, the way that happened was the coming of Jesus, the Son of God, and then after Jesus' ascension, the fact that the, the gift of knowing him to be the Son of God was opened up to all people, not just the Jewish people. But in particular, the messianic expectation that, it, that existed in the first century went back to people's um, understanding of God's covenant promise, specifically to King David. There was a Davidic covenant as well. And that promise was that David would have um, an heir on the throne of Israel forever. It would never end. Well, the Israelites in the first century AD, in the time of Jesus, they're looking at this saying, well, we don't have a king. We certainly don't have a king that's of the line of David. We haven't had a king in the line of David since the 500s BC, 6th century BC, when the Babylonians destroyed Judah, destroyed Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, and killed the king. And so God needs to make good on his promise. And they believed the way he was going to do it was by sending a Messiah, literally an anointed one. Because a king was defined as being the one that was anointed to be king. So Messiah is the, the Mashiach, literally, is the Hebrew word for anointed one. It is the same word as Christ in Greek. Messiah, Christ, same word. So the anointed one was expected by the Israelites to come from God, sent by God. They did not expect him to be divine. We need to be clear on that. This was something that Jesus, uh, it turned out the Messiah, who was Jesus, was the divine son of God. That was not part of their expectation. They thought he was going to be a human that is anointed and sent by God, very much like King David, and a descendant of King David, who would come in and, as King David had done, defeat all of Israel's enemies, reestablish the free nation of Israel, and in fact, would make them a great nation as they had been under King David and then later King Solomon, David's son. They actually had greater expectation than that. They expected that the Messiah would bring in the promised time, that he would bring in um, paradise, that he would establish the kingdom of God on earth, and that the Israelites and the nation of Israel would be right at the top of the pecking order for that. Okay? Look at a couple of verses here. Now remember that King David was about 1000 BC. That's pretty easy to remember. All right? So this passage from 2 Samuel 7 is the covenant that God made with King David right around 1000 or 1050 BC. From 2 Samuel chapter 7. Now then, tell my servant David, this is God giving instructions to the prophet to communicate with David. This is what the Lord Almighty says, I took you, that is David, from the pasture, from tending the flock, and appointed you ruler over my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone, and I have cut off all your enemies from before you. Now I will make your name great, like the names of the greatest men on earth. And, here's the promise to Israel. I will provide a place for my people Israel and will plant them so that they can have a home of their own and no longer be disturbed. Wicked people will not oppress them anymore as they did at the beginning. And I have done, uh, and I have done ever since the time I appointed leaders over my people Israel. I will give you rest from all your enemies. The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring, that is David's offspring, to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom, which God did in Solomon, David's son. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son. When he does wrong, I will punish him with a rod wielded by men, with floggings inflicted by human hands, 
but my love will never be taken away from him, as I took it away from Saul, when I removed, uh, whom I removed from before you. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. Now the part of this that refers to David's immediate offspring, Solomon, got fulfilled. But the Israelites, since this was done about 1000 BC, 500 years later, Babylon destroyed the southern kingdom of Judah. In the 700s, Assyria had already destroyed the northern kingdom of Israel. In the 500s, the temple, the city of Jerusalem, completely destroyed by the Babylonians. The, ba the Israelites are taken off into captivity. And so for, for over 500 years, that was in the, the 500s BC, we are now, you know, between five and 600 years later, and the Israelites are now being oppressed by the Romans, a different group of people. And they go back to this promise, and they go, wait a minute. God, you said that you were going to give us a home of our own that would no longer be disturbed, that wicked people would not oppress us anymore, and that you would give us rest from all our enemies. Well, first there were the Babylonians, 500 years after this promise. Then there were the Romans, 500 years after that. And so, because they believed in God, the Jews are saying, Okay, God, time to make good on your promise. We can't keep paying taxes to the Romans and taxes to Herod and taxes to the temple. You know, we can't continue to live under this kind of oppression. It's time you make good on your promise. That's the messianic expectation that was so present in the first century when Jesus comes along. They expected a new king like David in the line of David who would come from God to drive off the oppressors, the Romans, in the first century, and reestablish them as a great nation before God. All right? Now, in addition to the covenant promise that had been made to David, the promise of a Messiah or anointed one of God was reaffirmed down through history after, well, before there were promises, but after David especially. For instance, um, in Isaiah, more than any of the other prophets, but there's in several other prophets as well, we have the prophetic statements of Isaiah, which were seen by the Jews as promises of this Messiah to come. For instance, Isaiah 9, 6, and 7, which you will recognize because you hear it every Christmas. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. Here it is. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and zeal. I'm sorry, justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Now, we read this at Christmas because we understand this to be Jesus, which I think it was. I mean, this was a prophecy of Jesus. The first century Jews had been listening to this. This was written by Isaiah sometime around 700 B.C. So this is about 300 years or so after David. Um, they already were having trouble. Isaiah was writing about the time that the northern kingdom was destroyed by Israel, or uh, this northern kingdom of Israel was destroyed by Assyria, and Assyria was threatening the southern kingdom under King Hezekiah. And Isaiah was the prophet at that time telling Hezekiah, don't give in. Don't give up, the Assyrians. God will preserve you. But Isaiah writes this kind of stuff in 700 B.C., and the Jews read it for the next 700 plus years and say, this is the Messiah, the great king that God will send. Yes? You say that they don't expect him to be divine, but in here it says mighty God. He'll well, be called mighty God. Exactly. And there, is, there are passages in the Old Testament that refer to, that we believe are prophetic statements about Jesus that do indicate divinity. But that... You know, they thought there's only one God. There's not going to be another divine somebody come along. That's exactly why the, the Jews have trouble with Jesus as being the Son of God. So there are pieces of this that they just like, okay, we don't understand that part. Oh, and okay. they would just skip over it. <laughs> they were blinded. They were blinded by that. Okay. Okay. So yeah, they didn't get the divinity part, even though there are passages in Isaiah and elsewhere that suggest that he is going to be divine. I mean, the... They would say something like from Daniel. And Daniel comes quite a bit later. Daniel is after the Babylonian captivity. Daniel is writing from Babylon. Where he get in Daniel 7, we has the vision of the Son of Man, who will be given all authority and all power, and you know, and his kingdom will, will never end, which is 
what Jews understood the Son of Man to mean. So when people heard Jesus call himself the Son of Man, they didn't think he was saying he was just human. It meant the one who would be given all authority by the Ancient of Days, which is what you know, God is called in Daniel 7. And so they thought that even if he is divinely oriented in some way, if he is divinely appointed in some way, and in that way is a son of God, then he's, you know, it doesn't mean he's divine. In fact, one of the reasons that Jesus called himself the Son of Man instead of the Son of God, and this sounds funny to us today, is the Son of Man actually sounded more like a divine being to, to the Israelites because of Daniel 7 than the Son of God. Um, a couple of the prophets called themselves the Son of God over and over again. Yeah. And so, by Son of God, they meant, you know, a... Like a, a child of God. A child of God, exactly. You know, I'm a child of God. Well, that's how they interpret Son of God hmm. quite often. And so, one of the reasons scholars believe, and I agree with this, that Jesus didn't call himself the Son of God more often, is that actually people would use that to say, oh, well, yeah, you know, he's a prophet. He's a wise teacher. He's a great rabbi. Because that's what prophets did, is they called themselves the Son of God. Nobody called themselves the Son of Man... After, after Daniel 7 was written until Jesus. Because that actually has more power if you understand the Hebrew Scripture. You get that? Does that make sense? Okay. Um, and so they would see passages like this, Mighty God, and think, okay, Son of God. Just one that's appointed by God. Or, or else they would just go, okay, we don't get that. Let's go to the next passage. You know? um, but they did not get it that the Messiah would be himself divine. Another passage in Isaiah that deals with this is Isaiah 11. And Isaiah is chock full of this stuff. And you need to understand, Isaiah was considered the most important writing prophet of the Old Testament. When I say writing prophet, with the possible exception of Moses, but in terms of Moses in the category all by himself, apart from Moses, who wrote the first five books of the Old Testament, the Pentateuch, the Torah, after that, um, it's possible that Elijah might have been considered as great or greater than Isaiah, but Elijah was not a writing prophet. We have no book of Elijah. He's referred to elsewhere. Of the writing prophets, those who wrote books, Isaiah was considered by far the most important. So when we quote this stuff from Isaiah, that would especially have weight to any Jew or any Hebrew who had studied the word. If Isaiah said it, it would carry more weight than if Jeremiah or Malachi or one of these other guys did. And all of them have preferences too. But from Isaiah 11, a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. Who's Jesse? David's father of David. Father of David. So this is a this is a poetic way of saying that from the line of David. Okay. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of might. The spirit of the knowledge and fear of the Lord, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears, but with righteousness he will judge the needy. With justice he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and the breath of his lips he will, he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt, and faithfulness the sash around his waist. And here's where you get some of the imagery of paradise. You know, the ultimate... Um, new heaven and new earth kind of idea that the Jews have as well, just like Christians. The, the, the Jewish definition of the end of the world and what comes after is very similar to the Christian idea. And here's where you get some of that. The wolf will lie down with the lamb, the leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf and the lion and the yearling together, and the little child will lead them. Again, we use this at Christmas, but the Jews heard this as being the Messiah, the descendant of David coming to make a new kingdom on earth as God's, God's new uh, realm. The cow will feed with a the bear, their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the cobra's den, the young child will put its hand into the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the, sea, as the waters cover the sea. In that day, the root of Jesse will stand as a banner for the peoples. The nations will rally to him, and his resting place will be glorious. In that day, the Lord will reach out his hand a second time to reclaim the surviving remnant of his people from Assyria, from Lower Egypt, from Upper Egypt, from Cush, from Elam, from Babylonia, from Hamath, and from the islands of the Mediterranean. Some of the expectations for this Messiah was that he would bring paradise to earth, so there would be no more violence or death, that, and that he would recall all of the Jews to the Promised Land. Remember, the definition... Uh, for the Jew of 
the, the afterlife of salvation of heaven even, I mean, their idea would be a return from exile. The Jewish people throughout most of their history have been in one way or another in exile. It's only very short windows of time that they've not been in exile. And so the Jewish expectation of the fulfillment at the end of time was to return from exile, which is what this is about, recalling the Jews from all the different parts of the world. This also gives you an idea why the establishment of the nation of Israel in the late 1940s and the return of so many Jews to Palestine was such a big deal to the Jews. is because they saw that as beginning to be a fulfillment of the promise of what it was going to be like at the end. Now, so many Jews by the 1940s had no longer maintained, they no longer had a messianic expectation, but they had replaced that with a Zionistic expectation. Meaning they had left out the part about there would be a king, a leader, and they had focused entirely on the giving of the land and the return of the, of the Jewish people to a homeland, the promised land. That's, that's Zionism, the idea that Zion as a kingdom, uh, the promised land would be reestablished and people would return, as opposed to the messianic expectation, which involved a person, a leader, a king. The, most of the Jews today no longer have a messianic expectation, but many of them still expect that the Zionistic promise will be fulfilled and continue to be fulfilled, okay? Yes. Getting in a little more modern politics there for you, okay? Any questions about that? You see in these passages, again, especially passages that we think of as being Easter passages, that the expectation was so great for the Messiah. Now, I want us to look for a minute about Jesus, because we're talking about the life and teaching of Jesus. In the 12th century A.D., uh, so 1300s. Maimonides, the greatest of all the Hebrew teachers, the greatest of all the Jewish teachers, established the 13 principles of Judaism. And he also, at that point, identified, along with that, the, ma the six major um, objectives that will be fulfilled by the Messiah. Well, he included things like that he would, be he would be declared king, he would call all the Jews back to Israel, you know, things like that, which people, the Jews uh, who... Uh, who are who feel very strongly about this say, well, Jesus didn't do those things. Well, he actually did in a certain way, but they, Maimonides and everybody since the time of Jesus um, that has trying to discount Jesus as the Messiah, they overlook a lot of the details in terms of specific ways in which Jesus does fulfill or did fulfill Old Testament messianic prophecy. There are at least 44 detailed prophecies that Jesus fulfills. I'm going to give you like 14, 15, but one of them is kind of a, a lump. First, as we just read in Isaiah 11, he will be a descendant of David. The, nobody questions the descendancy of Jesus from the line of David. He was descended from David's line both through Joseph and through Mary. The line of Joseph uh, that Jesus descended from is outlined in the book of Matthew. The line of Mary is outlined in the book of Luke. So through both of his parents, that is his, his biological mother Mary, but his legal father, you know, because there was a legal, you know, as his stepfather, an adoptive father, Joseph was his legal father, and so he would have been an heir to that line. Um, both of those go back to David. So he was a descendant of David. He was born in Bethlehem, which is prophesied in Micah 5.2, and that actually is the prophecy that Herod and his scholars identified to tell the Magi where to find Jesus, and where Herod then goes later to try to kill Jesus. Um, the Messiah was supposed to be associated with Galilee. Isaiah 9 talks about Galilee being, you know, the focus of the Messianic expectation. Isaiah 7.14 says that the, a virgin will be with child and have a son, so the Messiah was to be born of a virgin. Um, Jeremiah 31.15 identifies that his birth would be accompanied by the massacre of children which is the massacre of the innocents in Bethlehem right after the Holy Family escapes. Herod, trying to kill this baby who was supposed to be the new king of the Jews, murders all the male children in Bethlehem. Um, the Hosea 11.1 1 says that the Messiah would spend some time in Egypt. Out of Egypt I have called my son, it says. Isaiah 40.3-5 says that the Messiah would, be, uh, would have an advance man. He would have a forerunner, one who went ahead of him to prepare the way which is John the Baptist, and we'll talk about that. Zechariah 9.9 9 identifies that the Messiah will enter Jerusalem riding on the foal of a donkey. Um, Jesus 
did that in order that that prophecy would be fulfilled. Both Psalm 22 and Zechariah 12 say that the Messiah will have his hands and feet pierced and that his side will be pierced, all of which happened during the crucifixion. Psalm 22.18 says soldiers would gamble for his garments, which we are told they did. And when he was crucified, he had a cloak uh, that was seamless. It was woven as one piece, which was made quite expensive. And we have the detail that instead of tearing it, they cast lots between themselves, the soldiers, in order to see who got to keep it. Psalm 69.21, oh, I'm sorry, Isaiah 53.12 says he will be crucified with criminals. Psalm 69.21 says he would be given vinegar to, greet and to drink. John 19 um, fulfills the, the idea that he would be declared king of the Jews. As I say, this is one of the reasons that, that Maimonides and others would have said Jesus wasn't the, uh, the Messiah because he wasn't declared king of the Jews. Well, he was, only not by the Jews. Um, all four of the Gospels recorded the fact that when Jesus was crucified, Pontius Pilate had a plaque nailed above his head that says, and the wording varies a little bit, some of them say, this is Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, some simply say, this is King of the Jews, but they all agree that Pontius Pilate declared Jesus to be King of the Jews, so in that regard, he was declared King of the Jews. Um, Psalm 2.7 says he will be declared the Son of God, and we also just read in Isaiah, where that was, uh, he's identified as mighty God. And then a whole lot of stuff gets wrapped up in the, the, the story of the suffering servant in Isaiah 53. It talks about the servant who is despised, rejected, stricken, afflicted, pierced for our transgressions, punished so that we might have peace, silent to his accusers, buried among the rich. Remember that Jesus was laid in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, a wealthy man. And that he returned to life after having died, bearing the sins of many. All of that is included in that one chapter of Isaiah. So in that regard, the, the huge messianic expectation that existed in the time of Jesus, his followers, after they got to know him, and his early followers were all Jewish, they began to see more and more. In fact, when you read the New Testament, the Gospel accounts especially, they will refer to these passages of Scripture and will say, and this was fulfilled in him, or... For instance, that he rode into Jerusalem on a colt, the foal of a donkey, so that scripture might be fulfilled. They looked back at it later and went, oh, wow, he did that. And you remember that it says back here in Isaiah or in Jeremiah or in Psalms, so that those, those things would be fulfilled. So Jesus fulfilled the expectation for the Messiah. And again, the accusations that have been made that he didn't fulfill them, well, you can, very strong arguments have been made that he did. But... If you have a bias to argue against something, then you can find <coughs> excuses. All right. Any questions about that, Joanne? Well, did the people that didn't believe him just see that as Jesus just did those things so that he could say, you know, I am the son of God because I did what the prophet said? Well, or they would say, I didn't see it. You say it so, but how do I know? You could be lying. I mean, there are a lot. An infinite number of excuses can be made for not believing those things, and yet we have the testimony of quite a lot of people that these things happen. As I say, it's one of the reasons that I believe God gave us four different Gospels from four different perspectives. They're not inconsistent, but they see it from different sides, and so we have multiple witnesses who will attest to these things as having actually been true. Plus, when most of these things were written about Jesus, it was when there were still people alive who would have seen it, who would have had the opportunity to say, that's not true. I was there, and that didn't really happen. And yet we have no record of that, of anybody claiming that this was not true. Were there many writings around, circulating around during Jesus' ministry that the people were reading, or was it pretty much oral? You mean and for the Jews? Yes. Um, there was not original writing being done. No. The, the Jews, in fact, one of the things that was distinctive about Jesus was that he spoke on his own authority. Jesus over and over and over again says, you have, read it, you have heard it said that blah, but I tell you. Well, the reason why he would use that expression is because the rabbis in those days would, would have thought it was prideful and inappropriate and even unrighteous to, to teach of your own authority, to give your own interpretation, um, with rare exceptions. And so therefore, they would always quote somebody else. They would quote the rabbi Hillel, or they would quote quote the, the Rabbi Shammai, and Jesus comes along and he speaks with authority himself in interpreting scripture, does not say, well, as Rabbi Hillel said, 
or you have heard it said by Rabbi uh, uh, Shammai, da-da-da. Jesus spoke on his own authority, and it really was different. It made a huge difference. We're going to talk about that when we talk about the ministries of Jesus and the teaching. Jesus spoke with his own authority. That answers your question by the fact that, no, there was not a lot of original writing going on. Everything they had was either the Hebrew Bible, or it was commentary on the Hebrew Bible that had been written by recognized um, scholars and teachers of righteousness, as they would call them, or you know, people who brought the religious authority. There were not a lot of other writings going on. Okay, for one thing, remember, there was no printing. So anything that was written was handwritten. And if it went out to more than one place, somebody had to copy it over. So that sort of suppressed people's enthusiasm for producing new books, okay? Um, so, gives you an idea. All right, uh, let's continue here. I want to talk now about childhood and start of ministry. First, the advent, the circumstances surrounding the death, of, or the birth of Jesus. This is the passage from Luke 2. The, the birth of Jesus is actually, oh, this thing keeps reformatting everything. <coughs> Sorry, I hope this is all going to fit on the screen. I've fixed it twice already, and for some reason the program keeps resetting re the margins and stuff so that it ends up what, wacky. Um, anyway, from Matthew 1 and from Luke 2 are the two uh, advent, the birth uh, stories. Mark and John uh, don't tell us about the birth of Jesus. Um, Mark jumps right into the ministry. He starts with John the Baptist, and John actually gives us, in John 1, the... Uh, co-eternal co nature of Jesus is having been there forever and then jumps ahead to the start of the ministry. So Matthew and Luke are the two stories of the birth. Luke says this, and again, you've all heard this at Christmas time, but um, think about it. There are a couple points I want to make on this. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place when, while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him, and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. Now... There's a number of very particular kinds of things in here, uh, and I'm going to do what I always do in Bible study. What strikes you about this? What There's some peculiar things here, and you've heard it so often you may not notice them. There yeah. are some very specific things that that are written there that can, you can almost pinpoint the day because of it. Exactly. Exactly historical. Luke especially is very particular to make a point of the fact that this is a real historical event. And he tells you exactly who was the emperor at the time, Caesar Augustus, what was taking place at this time, the census, and not just any census, this was the, the first census that happened while Quirinius was the governor of Syria. Exact historical markers so that we can identify when this was and that it really happened. You'll also notice that um, the as one of the aspects of the census is in order to count everybody accurately, they told everybody, you have to go back to your hometown. Now remember, the Jews all associated themselves as being part of a tribe. Different tribes had been assigned different parts of the Promised Land originally. So to the extent that they still had the, the recognition, I mean, that they were part of a tribe that had a hometown, then they would go back to that hometown. In this case, they followed it back as far as David, because both, both Joseph and Mary were descendants of David, and Bethlehem was the city of David. Okay, that's where he came from. And so they were told, you have to go back to your hometown, so everybody get, go back to where you are, and so we can keep track of not only how many people there are, but, but who they're related to, who they're connected to. And so everybody goes back to their hometown. Um, anything else strike you about this? Joanne. Well, that they asked everybody to go back to their hometown because they were of a tribe. What, how or why would Caesar care about that part? Well, simply, as a, it's an organizational thing. The Romans were very organized. So they would be able to, to identify, for instance, that, you know, where's the population growth occurring? Okay. You know, and they identified it not by geographical, you know, where people live right now so much as they would by who they're related to, you know, the lineages. And so that's why they had them go back to their hometown. Nowadays, in our culture, this seems so foreign to us, 
because who in the heck would go back to their hometown? I mean, I've lived in 19 places since since where my parents lived, all right? And, uh, and so we don't think that way. But for them, no matter how where they lived or how long it had been since they were in their hometown, they always had an anchor point there. And the Romans recognized that, and so they were having them all head back home. Yes? Uh, what does it mean by pledged to be married to him? They were engaged. Um, the idea of... Now, engagement to the, to the Jews... Engagement was a bigger commitment than, than being married. Being married simply meant you'd gone for the ceremony. When you were engaged to someone, or pledged to them, as in this case, you actually had a contract. Um, and it, it, we're going to look at that in a few minutes. Um, the idea was, if you wanted to break an engagement, nowadays you just you know, send out an email and say, we're not going to do this anymore. Um, but in those days, you had to go to the priests. You had to go through a legal process which involved the religious authorities to break the commitment that you had made. So the engagement or the pledging part of it was a bigger commitment than the actual marriage. The marriage simply meant you'd gone through the ceremony. And that's why, in fact, when, jo when Joseph first hears, as we're going to see in a minute, when Joseph first hears that Mary is pregnant, and it says he decided, you know, to, in one, one place it says to put her aside quietly, another says to divorce her quietly. Because you literally had a divorce from an engagement. They weren't even married yet. Okay? And that's why that was such a big deal. Now, we talked two weeks ago about the fullness of time. The fact that um, th there is there's an aspect to which it was the perfect time in history and the perfect location in the world for Jesus to have come. And yet, even though there was a fullness of time, it still was not a very hospitable place. I mean, there, there were great difficulties. Um, and obviously, the, the innkeeper was fairly inhospitable because he didn't, you know, he didn't find a place for them. They had to end up sleeping in a barn. A manger, which has been, all this stuff has been so romanticized, a manger is a food trough for animals. Okay, not very sanitary, not very pretty. Of course, they're pretty today when we have a little nativity scene, but they were back then. Okay, would you get rid of that rotten slop that pigs just finished eating so that we could put the baby in that thing? Okay, it was a very different kind of setting. So it was the fullness of time, the perfect time in many ways, but still not very hospitable. Jesus was not welcomed by the religious authorities at his birth, or later when they found out who he was, or by the political authorities, or by the innkeeper. But there were people who did welcome him. There were people who were excited about this. I want to talk about those, because each of these witnesses to his birth had a significant... Um, there's something significant about them that tells us something about the birth of Jesus and what it was going to lead to. First, there's Mary and Joseph. Obviously, Mary was happy about it. And Joseph, as the stepfather, was pleased that the baby was born. And he, been, he went through a trauma when he first found out his fiancée was pregnant. He knew he hadn't done it. But he was okay with this now because Gabriel had done it. But we need to see that Mary and Joseph represent the majority of the Jewish people at that time. They were, they were simple, poor, and very Jewish. Both David, or both uh, Joseph and Mary trace their lineage back to King David, one of the great characters in all of Jewish scripture. That we know that they were poor because, for one thing, if they'd had money, they wouldn't have ended up sleeping in a stable where their baby was born. Okay, you hold up a bag of gold, and all of a sudden they find an extra room for you. Okay? Um, I saw a TV show once, and somebody went into a hotel and said, I really need a room. They said, we don't have any rooms. They said, I, no, I really need a room. They go, well, we don't have a room. He said, well, you know what? The President of the United States is going to be here a little while. And tell me you don't have any rooms? And they go, well, the President of the United States will find him a room. And he goes, well, you know what? The President's not coming, so give me the room you're going to give to him. <laughs> All right? Or if, if you had said, Bill Gates is going to be here in five minutes, uh, we'll find him something. Okay? Same thing is true here. The innkeeper would have found a room if they had not been simple, poor Jewish folk. We also know they were poor because when they take Jesus to the temple to dedicate him, there, there are sacrifices required of people who can afford it and sacrifices for poor people. And they did the two doves or two pigeons, which is the poor person's uh, sacrifice. All right? So Mary and Joseph obviously were witnesses to the birth, and they represented the common people. They were simple, they were poor, they were Jewish. Then you have the Magi who show up. We'll look at that passage later, but I want to make a point here. The Magi were the opposite 
in every imaginable way to Mary and Joseph. They were sophisticated and scholarly. These were great magi, probably astrologers, but that was back when astrology was the highest of all sciences. They studied history, they studied the stars, astronomy, astrology, they were learned people and very sophisticated. Very, they also were very wealthy. They brought very expensive gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Frankincense and myrrh both were, were worth more than their weight in gold. So people would go, okay, they brought gold, but then this other stuff, you know, tree sap and something else. Those things were used for making very expensive perfumes. They were used in, in uh, funerary rites. They were very, very expensive, more than their weight in gold. And so they were wealthy, and they were foreigners. They were not Jews. Tradition has it that two of them were from Persia or somewhere in the east. We know that they were all from the east somewhere. But that one of them traditionally was also from Africa who you know, had been living and studying in Persia um, in the east and then came. They were the farthest thing from being Jewish. Then you have, of course, the shepherds. The shepherds would have been undoubtedly younger. You remember the number of times that we have that um, shepherds were boys. You know, David, as a child, was the shepherd boy. And so we have this image of, and now even if they were adults, they would not have been old people, because you didn't sleep outside in the cold and everything if you were old. You had to be reasonably young. Sierra? I've heard that a lot of them were actually ex-convicts. Well, that's what I'm getting to. <laughs> so the idea that they were younger, they were outdoorsy, you know, they weren't, you know, stay-at-home, in-the-house kind of people. They lived outside all the time. And they were likely not very religious. And the reason I say that is because shepherds had a reputation for being really unsavory characters. They were marginalized. Well, they were, in fact, by law, shepherds could not serve in any judicial uh, position, nor could they be witnesses in court, because they were considered completely, you know, just, Unclean. no, un untrustworthy. untrustworthy, all right? Uh, if, if they were, if they handled pigs, they would have been unclean. If they handled sheep or goats or, or something, they would, wouldn't have been necessarily unclean, but they simply were not thought of. Um, they, almost all shepherds, not all, but almost all shepherds were hired people, and it was just assumed that they were going to steal part of the, part of the herds as they went along. You know, new, new baby uh, goats or, or sheep would be born, and they'd sell it before the owner knew that they were there, because they're out in the wilderness for months at a time, and the owner's not around. And so this idea was they were most certainly not the most righteous or pious. The reputation they had was like... You know, like the coarsest kind of dock workers might be today. Excuse me, some of you guys used to be dock workers. Think, right? But you get the idea, this sort of rough and tumble, blue collar, you know, do what it takes to get it done kind of guy, and not sophisticated at all. Here. But they also could not do what the Pharisees wanted as far as the law was concerned because they didn't have facilities to wash or do anything. Well, that's true. I mean, they, they, because they tended to be poor, it was not a high paid position, it's not a job anybody really wanted. In fact, when the Israelites were always herders, David was a shepherd, you know, um, and on and on. Uh, they, the Joseph's brothers were out wandering around with the herds when Joseph went to find them. When they went into Egypt, one of the reasons the Pharaoh and the Egyptians all welcomed them is because the Egyptians didn't like having to take care of animals. They thought it was a horrible thing to have to do. And they were very happy that here's this group of people that do this all the time, and they're apparently very good at it. So let the Israelites, you know, take all the herds, you know, take care of your herds and ours too. Take them over to Goshen, away from the city, and take care of all the animals. And that way we won't have to mess with it. Because it was considered, a, you know, a, an unpleasant, dirty, you know, low-life job. So the shepherds were the, the other side of the tracks kind of people. And as Sierra said, some of them probably would have had criminal pasts. They also had to work on Sunday, just hit me. Oh, right. Sabbath, well, Saturday, yeah. Sabbath. Yeah, uh, they, they couldn't say, okay, you know, we're not going to work on, this, on Saturdays, the, the Sabbath day, because, you know, we're just going to leave the animals here and hope that they're here when we get back. You know, that's, that's not the way it worked. So, so a very different, the, the point I'm making here has to do with the difference in these groups. And then you have Simeon and Anna that we'll look at a little bit. When Jesus is taken to the temple after the 40 days of purification, you know, Mary could not go to the temple for 40 days after she gave birth because it was 40 days to be purified after that. After 40 days, they went to present Jesus at the temple, and they run into two people, Simeon and Anna, both of them very old, 
Both of them lived there at the temple, apparently. They were both city dwellers. Um, and both very pious. They were righteous, sufficiently righteous, that both of them were able to detect immediately that Jesus was the divine Son of God. Uh, it's as though, you know, Mary and Joseph come into the temple in Jerusalem, hundreds, even thousands of people around. Nobody notices them. They're just two poor folks there with their new baby to dedicate the baby. And yet, Simeon, who lives at the temple and has been a pious man of God for his whole life, as best we can tell, sees them and is enough of a man of God that he recognizes immediately that this is the Son of God. And he asks to hold the baby. And he has one of the beautiful songs that we have in the gospel. It's called the Nunc Dimittis, which means now dismiss. Because um, he, he says, Lord, now dismiss, dismiss your servant because I have seen the promised salvation. Simeon knows that this is the anointed one of God. And it's this, there are four songs uh, in the gospels. There's the song of Mary, um, which, you know, the beautiful statement that she is the handmaiden of the Lord and obedient to him. Um, then we, we have the song of Zechariah, the son of John. We have the song of the angels, the Gloria in Excelsius. And then we have the song of Simeon. Beautiful poem, you know, of this idea of dismiss me now, Father. I can die because I've seen the fulfillment of your promise to Israel. And then Anna, an old woman who was a prophetess, who also lived in the temple and had lived there for 80-some years after her husband's death. She, too, is able spiritually to recognize the glory that this is the Son of God. When you look at these four sets of people who recognized, in the case of the shepherds, for instance, they were told by the angels, the magi, being astrologers, had seen the star and knew what it represented. The Simeon and Anna had the spiritual ability to recognize Jesus after his birth. And obviously, Mary and Joseph you know, had both been told by the angel Gabriel who this Jesus was, they represent all of humanity. They, in a very real way, indicate to us at the birth and presentation of Jesus, the very start of his life, that Jesus is there for everybody. He is there for the simple, poor Jewish people, represented by Mary and Joseph. He is there for the sophisticated and scholarly, wealthy, and the foreigners. All nations of the earth will be blessed of this one. He repre he's there for those who are outdoorsy, even unsavory, the shepherds, the blue-collar folks, the people who, you know, probably are in need of a physician, as Jesus said later, uh, who are not righteous, and those who are older city dwellers who have committed their whole lives to worship of God and recognize that Jesus is the fulfillment of that promise. That covers the whole spectrum. When Jesus is born and presented, we have clear indication in these people that all people of the world, young, old, rich, poor, Jewish, foreigner, righteous, unrighteous, all of them are the ones that Jesus came for. And that's a very powerful thing. Okay? And Jesus affirms that later on in his life. Okay? Any questions about that? Yes, Susan. Not exactly about that, but what's the definition? I've read that the synagogue is in the temple. What's the definition to separate the synagogue from the temple? Um, they may have practiced some of the synagogue services in the temple. The, the temple was where, was the throne of God, literally. The Holy of Holies is thought to be God's place on earth. Uh, it is where the animal sacrifice was. It's where the priests presided. It was the center of both the religion and the, the culture and the government of the Jews. Synagogues, and, and there's only one temple, and everybody was expected to come there at least once a year. It was recommended they come there several times a year for different festivals, but they, they were expected to be there at Passover for sacrifice. Now, the synagogue was, was a gathering place away from the temple usually. Now it's possible they did synagogue services there, but synagogues tended to be out in the country. Um, they were places, there were no priests, there was no ordained ministers there. They simply had teachers, rabbis, and anybody who showed a proclivity for that and that seemed to have a gift, a knack for it, could teach. 
you know, Jesus was called rabbi, even though he had no formal ordination of any kind. He was not of the tribe of Levi. He had no reason for that. But anybody could stand, read the scripture, and teach if they were an adult Jewish male. That was also a place where they had prayers together. They read the scripture out loud so that people could hear it. it was, they were schools. That's where they taught the young people the study of Torah and the prophets and writings. You know, uh, and then it was a community center so that the Jews could see that as a focal point, especially in areas where the <coughs> Jews were a minority. That was where they kept got together to maintain their Jewishness. Remember that the synagogues were invented. Now, there had been some sort of synagogue away from the temple kind of places for gathering and prayer and, and reading of, of Torah earlier. But the synagogue system as we understood it later and by the time of Jesus was invented during the Babylonian captivity. The temple had been destroyed. And the Jews had to figure out how do we still worship God? How do we continue to learn about God? Uh, how do we keep from being assimilated into these foreign cultures and, and become half, you know, half Jew, half something else? And the, the answer was the synagogue. A place where they studied and learned God's word in the Hebrew Bible. It's where they prayed. It's where they read the scripture out loud. It's where they you know, trained young people especially. Um, and it was a community center where they came together to celebrate birthdays and holidays and special festivals and almost everything else. Which is one of the reasons the Jews ended up with so many holidays. You know, if you've ever had friends who were Jewish, you know, and they, and they, they got a holiday all the time. I mean, they put the Catholics to shame in terms of how many special days they would take off. Uh, and that's one of the reasons was because they used that as a tool to make sure that they remembered their Jewishness during the time of captivity in Babylon. Okay. So, I'm not familiar with synagogue and temple being in the same place, but it's not inconsistent because the activities of the temple and of the synagogue were complementary but not the same. The temple was priests sacrificing animals. You know, the, the, literally the Holy of Holies, the place where atonement was made. The synagogue was the place of reading of scripture, of prayer, of community life, etc. Okay? Isn't it kind of confusing that nowadays modern Jews will say, I'm going to temple? Right. Well, that's true. And, and so it, that's kind of the... That's true. Some Jews will say, I'm going to temple, when what they actually mean is synagogue. <coughs> temple became synonymous with, with uh, being Jewish. Okay, right. and, and practicing, it became synonymous with practicing your, your Judaism, practicing your Jewishness. So they would say, I'm going to temple, and in fact what they're doing is going to synagogue. And okay. is there still only one temple? There is no temple now. None. There's none. In fact, that's why there's no longer animal sacrifice, there's no longer Levitical priests. None of that has, has existed since 70 AD, which is when the, the, the second, the, the destruction of the second temple. When you study this stuff, they'll talk about the first temple era, which was between Solomon when he built the first temple, the son of David built the first temple, up until the time the Babylonians destroyed it. So it was from about 950 BC to 586 BC. That's the first temple period. Then between 586 and about 500, you know, less than 100 years, uh, when the Persians defeated the Babylonians and let them go back, one of the first things they did was they started rebuilding the temple. And then Herod comes along in you know, the first century and he, and he makes it beautiful again. He finishes it because apparently it was, they had a temple but it was pretty ugly after Zerubbabel and those guys built it. Um, and Herod fixed it up and made it grand again. But then the second temple period is from when Zerubbabel and the, and the people went back to Israel and rebuilt the temple up until 70 AD. So there's about a 500 year period in there that they had the second temple. And then that was destroyed by the Romans. Today there is no temple. The Temple Mount in Jerusalem, if you go to Jerusalem, the Wailing Wall, or the Western Wall it's also called, is the only part of the temple that still exists. And that's why it is the holiest of all places to the Jews, is that it's the only part of the temple that remains. The Temple Mount, meaning the little hill, Mount Moriah, the little place where the temple existed, is now the site of the Dome of the Rock, that gold-domed, a uh, mosque, it's a Muslim place of worship. Well, the Jew, it's not only it would be illegal, but the Jews, in principle, will not destroy another worship place. So they can't, you know, take it over by force and destroy it and rebuild the temple. But they expect that at some point God will send an earthquake or something to destroy the Dome of the Rock. And when, they, when that happens, they're ready to come in and rebuild the temple. They actually have, I think we've talked about that before in one of the classes, they have reconstituted all of the uh, accoutrements for, for the temple. 
they have the labors and the sea and all of the sacrificial stuff and the alt horned altar and all of that stuff. The outfit for the priests is all made. The, uh, Even the rib heifer. Well, and so their expectation is at some point, God will miraculously destroy the dome of the rock. They will rebuild the temple on the Temple Mount. And it can't be anywhere else. It has to be there. And that they will reinstitute sacrificial Judaism at that point. That's the expectation of a fairly small group, but it's a very intentional group. Yes, Ron. I've heard it said that it's comforting to know that the Muslims won't destroy the Temple Mount. Like it's safe for a while. Um, that the Jew Muslims own the, the Muslims, Jews. Muslims, they 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 don't want anything bad to happen to that location. So right. Well. Because it's there. Yeah, it's that's there. considered a holy site to all three monotheistic religions. Because that's where the temple was. It's believed that with within what's now the Dome of the Rock was the site where uh, Abraham was prepared to sacrifice Isaac before God stopped him. And it's the place from which uh, Muhammad is said to have leapt on his horseback into heaven. Um, and obviously, you know, it's as being the center of Jerusalem, it's a holy site to Christians. So, yeah, it's a pretty important place. Okay, we're going to take a break. Let's take 10 minutes. We'll come back at 2.15. Start back. I want to now uh, look at aspects of birth, infancy, youth, and start of ministry. So particularly, the birth of Jesus is represented, as I said earlier, in Matthew 1, 18-25 and Luke 2, 1-7. I gave you the Luke passage a minute ago. But here is the version of it in Matthew. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. Now understand, they're engaged. They're not technically married, but the commitment was so strong that it was called a divorce if you broke the engagement. It's also true that this shows you something about Joseph, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, uh, about, yeah, Joseph's character. Yesterday I was teaching about Joseph and, and his brother's Jacob's son, so <laughs> my, my mind is, is uh, slipping here. Uh, Joseph could have called for her to be stoned for having committed adultery because they were engaged. The fact that he did not want to disgrace her but wanted to divorce her quietly is an indication of his character. Right? But after he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. He, um, she will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Jesus is a version, of, is sort of a Latinized version of the name Joshua, which means God saves. That's why it says Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. That's from Isaiah. The virgin will be with, uh, conceive and give birth to a son. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. There's a lot of stuff in here, but one thing I would point out to you in, in respectful disagreement with our Catholic brothers and sisters who maintain that Jesus was ever virgin, yeah. or that Mary was ever virgin, um, that she never had any other children, and the other children that are identified in the New Testament are cousins or something else, but that she remained a virgin throughout her whole life. The fact that it says, um, was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant, and then down here, but he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son. Both of those passages seem to indicate that after Jesus was born, they consummated their marriage as a married couple, and that she, then the other passages that say that Jesus had brothers and sisters, including the idea that James the Just, who became the head of the Jerusalem Council later on uh, in the book of Acts, was the half brother of Jesus? Half brother meaning the child of both of Joseph and Mary. Yes. On what basis do they do they say that they were cousins when the scripture in English is translated very clearly? Well, and sisters. the Hebrew word, which is usually translated brother and sister, could be translated as just a relative. But they're straining to make it say that, and the reason they do it is they start with the premise that Mary had to be different. She couldn't have had carnal relations with her husband. 
and, uh, and their, their argument is based on the, the Hebrew structure. Uh, it's based more upon what they believe God has revealed to the leaders of the church, then, because the um, the ideas of the magisterium, that is the official leadership of the church, is considered equal in authority and as much a result of the Holy Spirit's direction as is the Scripture. Those two things are equal, and so they believe they've been given extra biblical instruction about the virginity of Mary, ever virgin. Yes. How did, how old were they? deal with the, but he did not consummate their marriage until? They would say, well, that, that, until doesn't mean that they did afterwards. They, they never did. And then he's just, that's just, the Catholics would say that means they didn't <laughs> consummate their, their marriage uh, uh, before Jesus was born, and they didn't after either. Okay. I, don't ask me to defend it. <laughs> I disagree with it. Marvin. Well, they have an interesting concept whereby since Mary's womb bore the holy child of God, that to defile it afterwards and have normal men born of her would be like yeah. that in the temple of Jerusalem. So. Right. Yeah. It's an honorable thought, right? Um, right. And there's a lot of other stuff having to do with the... And, and I, don't think, I don't think we as Protestants give Mary enough credit, mm -hmm. just so you know. But I believe they go too far. For instance, the idea that Mary was born sinless, that Jesus was without sin because Mary was without sin. That's part of the doctrine. Um, and the fact that Mary was was assumed into heaven at her death, just you know, automatically. Um, there's a lot of other stuff having to do with that, which are which I believe are doctrines built up to try to defend a premise that they have about Mary that's not biblical. And I think we'd be remiss, though, to be fighting with them over the no. because they're pretty much extraneous to the whole message of the gospel. So if we want to divide, then we can fight over it. Otherwise, we can say, I don't know. As far as I know, this is what I believe in. Right. And those of you who have been around know that I, you know, I've, I've said many, many times, I have brothers and sisters in the Lord who are Catholic, and I know they love the Lord. I know they'll see them, I'll see them in heaven, and there I can go neater, neater, neater. Yeah. Those things. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, they are saved. The difficulty is that when the focus becomes... Uh, more on Mary than on Jesus, or on Mary and Jesus equally. You know, there was great fear. I have great respect for John Paul II, but there was real fear because he was a Mariologist that he, before his death, they thought he might declare Mary co-redemptrix with Jesus. And if he'd done so, the rift between Catholics and Protestants would have been irreparable. Mm -hmm. But rather than dwell on the differences, we should dwell on the similarities. Yeah. But I'm there. teaching a content, and so exactly. we have to get into some of those views. Yeah. I disagree. I asked the question, and well, he responded. And, 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 and it's, not to, it's not to, you know, uh, smack Catholics around or anything. It's simply to say there are ways in which we differ, and here's one of them. Exactly. Joanne? Um, I, I heard somewhere that, and I don't know if this is true, the question is that a lot of the Jewish girls had hoped that they would be the mother of Jesus. Those who were of the line of David, yes, it would have been uh, not uncommon. The ex that's back to the messianic expectation was so strong that God, you know, we're surprised God hasn't done it already, but any day now, somebody's going to get somebody is going to, you know, give birth to the Messiah, because they expected him to be a person of the line of David. And so every, you know, the line of David was pretty big. And so any any young Jewish girl who was the line of David probably did dream that she might be the one who would bear it. So that would make it easier for Joseph to also understand the dream. Well, uh, there was nothing about, even though it says a virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, they could go back later and point to that and go, yeah, that's what, you, but that was not what they really expected. You know, that was not in the front of their mind with regard to their messianic expectation. Even though we look at this prophecy now and understand them, in hindsight, they thought that this was going to be a human being of the line of David, like David, or maybe like Judas Maccabeus, who had led the Hasmonean, uh, you know, the, the Maccabean rebellion that led to the, the Jewish kings of the Hasmonean uh, monarchy. They didn't really have a conception that he was going to be in some way supernatural, either divine or born of a virgin. It was only later that we go back and look at that and go, well, it says that right there. Why did you guys miss it? <laughs> but they didn't think about that when they were thinking about the coming Messiah. Yeah, I'm just thinking of Joseph when, you know, when he had the dream of the angel. I mean, just think what he's going through. You yeah. know, I mean, his betrothed, his pregnant, da 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 I mean, he's in I don't think any of us would have been thrilled about that. You know? Yeah, so how he would believe it is just amazing. Yeah, well, an angel told him, and it, and it was consistent with what Mary had said, so uh, first here, Kenneth, no. right, you sure? Yeah. Kenneth? 
Well, I mean, just if you stop and consider what Mary was choosing when she said yes to God, that all the rest of your life you're going to be viewed as someone who had, you know, who was an committed immoral. immoral, that your son was, you know, illegitimate, and that you think about, I grew up in a small town, that's going to follow you for the rest of your life, and everybody's going to know, and they're going to remind you for the rest of your life. And well, you think about... You're absolutely right, and in fact, the, the consequences for Mary were potentially worse than even any of us who come from a small town might have imagined. Mm -hmm. We can imagine what it's like for somebody to, you know, to get pregnant out of wedlock and have an illegitimate baby and for everybody to always go, oh, oh, oh. But think about a culture where they stone women for doing yeah. that. Yeah. Okay, and that was acceptable to, to stone them for that. Yeah, it's a, it's a whole different category of, of uh, judgment that, that she would have undergone. So. And, I mean, even talk, tell her telling her dad about it. <laughs> or, you know, right. yeah, tell me another one, Mary. Exactly. You know, and it would take a visitation <laughs> by an angel. <laughs> I mean, it would take a visitation by an angel to convince yeah. someone of something other than Okay, a couple of real quick ones, and then i got I got to get going. We're going to not finish. Were you saying that the Jewish girls now still... No, 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 in, in Mary's time. In, in oh. Jesus, leading up to Jesus. Yeah, but were, not... No, not now, no. The expectation for the Messiah is very dim in the Jewish people today. Most of them have replaced that Jewish, that Messianic expectation with a, a Zionistic expectation. The focus is on the Promised Land and the re return to Israel and all of that. Jerry? How did Joseph come up with the name Jesus? Well, um, the, Mary was told, you, you'll name him Jesus. Oh, Mary okay. told. The, the indication that they were told, you'll name him Jesus because he will be the savior of his people. Joseph was told that. Joseph, right Joseph was told. Right, okay. right in that passage. Yeah. You are to give, you are to give him the name Jesus. Uh, I'm about that, yes. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. Jesus, there you go. Because he will save his people from his sin. That's where I said Jesus is the, version, is the Greek version of Joshua, which means God saves. Okay, i got a lot more stuff to do. Let's get to this. <laughs> Let's talk about the circumcision and presentation of the temple, which are right next to each other in Luke. On the eighth day, when it was time to circumcise the child, all Jewish males are circumcised on the eighth day. Um, the name the angel had given him before he was conceived, when the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, that's 40 days after birth, before Mary could appear at the temple, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it was written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord, and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. As I said earlier, that's the sacrifice that was allowed for people who were too poor to offer a lamb or other you know, larger animals as part of the sacrifice. The, um, in the most ancient times for the Israelites, the firstborn would be consecrated to God in a way in terms of giving them to the temple to serve there, as happened with Samuel, for instance. Um, but by this time, the, the Israelites or the Jews had grown so large that if everybody did that with their firstborn, they'd have a whole town full of guys standing around wondering what they're going to do now because they've been consecrated for service. Instead, they had reached the place now where to consecrate simply means to spiritually dedicate to the Lord, but then take them home again. You know, don't leave them at the temple like they did with Samuel, all right? Um, and so Jesus was circumcised as a Jewish boy would have been. After 40 days, they went to the temple, and it was while they were there at the temple for the consecration rites and offering the sacrifice of consecration that Simeon and Anna both recognized that this is the promised one of God. Now, um, again, birth and infancy. This is the story of the Magi, which I want to go through, because it too, and you'll notice how often in these passages, we have references to the prophetic expectation. All of these are messianic prophecies that were expected to be fulfilled. And then once Jesus came, everybody's going, wow, look at that one. Look at this. People began to recognize that these writings, which we know were a long time before Jesus, actually were specifically fulfilled in Jesus. From, uh, this is from Matthew, the second chapter. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. The 
Magi would have been scholars, particularly astrologers, but astrology was the high was a high science back then. It was not it was not the column that you read in the newspaper, okay? Where everybody basically is the same. Uh, it was a very scholarly pursuit. Matt, and in fact, it's believed that they had access to knowledge that, uh, because they were such scholars, that ordinary people didn't have. Magi is the root for our word magic, or magician. Because the idea that they somehow, because they were so scholarly and so learned in these mysteries of astrology, that they could do things we couldn't do. But it was a very respectable thing back then, unlike today. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. Here's another king. Herod wouldn't like that. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. Liar, liar, pants on fire. In fact, they had no interest at all in worshiping. Okay? Now, the, there's a reason why he wanted to find out when the star was, because later on he has all children two years and younger. He wanted to know how old this baby might be so that he'd have a target when it came time to try to do something about it. This continues. <clears throat> After they had heard the king, that is the Magi, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Now, this almost certainly happened quite a while after Jesus was born. Apparently, Joseph and Mary and Jesus stayed for quite a while in Bethlehem. And the reason we say that is because um, we know that Jesus was circumcised at the eighth day. They then went back to the temple at the 40th day after he was born, the period of purification, and offered a sacrifice to consecrate Jesus, and it was the sacrifice of poor people, which they probably wouldn't have done if they had just gotten all this gold and stuff. And then we also have um, the period of time when they go down into Egypt and then come back again. I'll talk about that in just a minute, the flight into Egypt and the murder of the innocents. Let's talk about that right now. When they had gone, that's the Magi had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said, take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. Herod's going to be the competition. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, Out of Egypt I called my son. Again, you keep seeing these messianic prophecies uh, referred to. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious, and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under. There's that, when did you first see the star coming into play? In accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi, then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. Now, we tend to have this vision that <coughs> thousands and thousands of babies were killed. Well, Bethlehem was not a very big town, and there were not that many towns in the vicinity. We were talking maybe a hundred at most or so. That's enough to have been slaughtered. I'm not diminishing that. Well, we do just need to have a historical perspective on it. How so, long, how, yes. long, how long were, were uh, Joseph and Mary in Egypt? We don't know. There's no indication. All we know is pretty much what you've seen here and this next passage, there the return of Nazareth. I have a question. Yes. Uh, what says in Rama? Is Rama the area around Bethlehem? Correct. Yeah. And then Rachel. 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 Rachel was the the uh, one of the wives. She was the beloved wife of Jacob. 
And in the same way, they might say they were children of Abraham. Okay. okay. They're talking about babies, and so they're, they're, they're hearkening more to the mother kind of thing. And so Rachel was the wife of Israel, the father of the 12 tribes of Israel. And so Rachel is a symbol for the mother of all of the Israelites. Okay. You know? And so the, the death of these children strike at the heart of the motherly instinct of all Israel. Okay. Okay. That's what they're talking about. After Herod died, and we don't know how long, some scholars have said they thought that maybe Joseph and Mary and Jesus, you know, the Magi came like the same day that Jesus was born, then they left, they run off to Egypt, and two weeks later Herod dies, they run back from Egypt, and then they go to the temple after 40 days, and, and, but I don't think that works, and here's why. This passage, after Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, get up. Take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel, for those who were, who were trying to take the child's life are dead. So he got up, that is Joseph, took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning in Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee, and he went and lived in a town called Nazareth. So was fulfilled, here it is again, what was said through the prophets that he would be called a Nazarene. Now, the reason that this all didn't happen in a month so that they got back from Egypt in time to go to the temple 40 days after Jesus was born is uh, right here, Archelaus. Archelaus was one of the three sons of Herod the Great who inherited the kingdoms. Archelaus was given Judea and Samaria. Um, his two brothers, Herod Antipas, was given uh, Galilee and Perea, east of the Jordan River. And Herod Philip was given um, the area north and east, okay? Um, but before they got those assignments, they had to go to Rome and appeal to the emperor. Each of them, Archelaus, Herod Antipas, and Herod Philip, all three thought they should be the ruler of the whole thing, like their father had been. Well, Caesar <coughs> decided to split it up between the three of them. So they had to make the trip all the way to Rome, spend quite a bit of time in Rome appealing to Caesar before he decided the three of you are all going to be splitting it up and here's how it's going to happen. Then returning and establishing himself as ruler over Judea and Samaria um, before all this happened. That didn't happen in a month. Okay? It took longer than that. Which means they, uh, Joseph, Mary, and Jesus must have been a while in staying in Bethlehem the shepherds and everybody showed up right away. They left. Jesus is circumcised. They present him in the temple 40 days later, and they're still there for a while when the Magi show up. And then they're told, go to Egypt. They go to Egypt. All of this happens with the rulers, and Archelaus takes over, and then they come back and go up north to Galilee. And yes. the Bible points out that they, they saw the child in the house, not, not a stable. Right? Okay. Yeah. But they, he was no longer in, they were no longer in the stable in Jesus in a manger when the Magi show up. Yeah. If the, the, if the Magi told Herod that the baby was born two weeks ago, he wouldn't have killed two-year-olds. No. Yeah. Well, exactly. Well, they, it's also true that um, Herod was sort of just hedging his bets because they said, the question Herod asked was, when did you first see the star? Well, based upon the fact that he killed infants two years and younger, it would have been something like 18 months ago or two years ago or something. But that doesn't mean that that's when Jesus was born. Herod is saying, I'm making, I'm making sure, I'm using an outside parameter. It could have been that they saw the star a year before Jesus was conceived as an indication. And then they, you know, they had to plan and figure out what does this mean. And they did the research and said there's a star in the east and what's going on. And during all this time, they had to figure out what it meant that there was born, going to be born the king of the Jews. And they got up, finally, got, you know, got their expedition together, you know, and loaded the Humbers, and they started out after this <laughs> star. So there's any amount of time that could happen in there. Herod asked the question, when did you first see the star? That doesn't necessarily mean two years ago was when Jesus was born. It means that's when they first saw the star. And then Herod killed everybody two years and younger because it, Jesus had to have been born sometime in that period. Okay? Good. All right, um, now we get Jesus' growth, his visit to Jerusalem at the temple, uh, in the temple at age 12, and then a description of his development. We are told, and I've cut out some middle sections here, which are wonderful things that, that I'm sure that you all have memorized already, but um, Luke 2, 
And the child, that is Jesus, grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was on him. Then, every year, Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. All Jewish adults who could possibly get there were supposed to go to Jerusalem for the Passover. And apparently they did so every year. When he was 12 years old, they, when he, that is Jesus, was 12 years old, they went up to the festival according to the custom. When a Jewish boy becomes 12, he goes through his bar mitzvah. He technically becomes a man for all intents and purposes. He can attend temple. He can read, or, or synagogue. <laughs> he can read in public from the Torah and the, the Ketuvim and ne, uh, Nevaim, the, the scriptures. And at age 12, he is expected to accompany his parents to the festival of Passover. So that's why it's happening now. Prior to that, they legitimately could have said, okay, you're going to stay home with your aunt and uncle or cousins or whatever while we go to Jerusalem. When he gets to be 12, it's expected he's supposed to go. So when he was 12 years old, they went up to the festival according to the custom. After the festival was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were unaware of it. Then we have a little section in there where they're going up and down the caravan saying, have you seen Jesus? Has anybody seen Jesus? Where's Jesus? And they find out he's lost, and so they go back, and they start looking for him in the city. After three days, they found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them, and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother, this is a mother for you, especially a Jewish mother, his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Why were you searching for me, he asked. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he was saying to them. Then he went down to Jerusalem with them. Remember, from Jerusalem, uh, down, down to Nazareth. From Jerusalem, every place is down. So he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Another translation of this passage, did, uh, didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? A legitimate alternate translation is, didn't you know I had to be about my father's business? Yes. The words can mean either one of those, and you'll read, the, read it translated either way. It basically means the same thing, about the business of God in God's house. Um, okay, I think that's all I'm going to say about that right now, because I need to move forward on stuff. But you understand now why he was 12 years old when all of this happened, and that at the age of 12, Jesus is still a boy. He's still obedient to his parents. He's still doing what they tell him, but growing in wisdom and in favor with God and man. But he's not an ordinary kid. <clears throat> At this point, he probably both mentally, socially, spiritually is able to understand something of who he is and what he's about. The age of accountability we talk about in Christian circles, the point at which a child is able to know that they're responsible for their own actions, that they, are, you know, they can make a choice for good or evil. Jesus has reached that point and yet was without sin, we are told. He chose the right. Okay, um, I want to now look at the forerunner, John the Baptist. John the Baptist is a critically important part of the Jesus story that, again, we don't often give enough credence to or enough, enough emphasis on. Um, there are several prophecies about the coming of John the Baptist, particularly... The two I've listed here, Isaiah 40, 3 to 5, says this. A voice of one calling, in the wilderness prepare the way for the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. Those of you who are Handel fans can start singing along with me here from the Messiah. Um, the rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all people will see it together. So a voice of one calling in the wilderness... Prepare the way for the Lord. And then from Malachi, the third chapter, first verse, says, I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. This is God speaking. I will send a messenger who will prepare the way before me. Jesus was the divine Son of God. Then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. So there are clear prophecies that before the Messiah, before Jesus was to appear and for his ministry to begin, there would be one who went before him. The stories, especially in Luke, and by the way, Luke always has more detail about 
the lives of the, of the little people or the, of the peripheral people. And in this case, he has much more about the stories of Zechariah and Elizabeth, the parents of John, and of you know, the, the prophecies about John. The beautiful um, song of Zechariah about his son is in there. I'm going to mention that in a minute. Um, and so Luke has a lot more detail on some of these kinds of things. We have um, the story of the birth of John the Baptist. And I want to read to you uh, one section from Luke, which I think is hilarious. And it's hilarious because it, it, you have to understand it's hilarious. What happened with Zechariah was a priest. During his temple service one time, angel of the Lord appeared to him while he was serving in the temple. Because they had, they had remember I told you, they couldn't just keep giving their firstborn children, their firstborn sons to the temple because they had way too many people. Well, even the people who were Levitical priests, who were part of the priesthood based upon their, their families, they, there were too many of them. And so they had a cycle. It's like when your, your, uh, your turn will come. Well, at a particular time, it says when Zachariah's turn had come to serve in the temple, he goes, an angel appears to him while he's serving the temple and says, your wife Elizabeth's going to have a son. And Zachariah says, you are kidding me. We're both all dried up. We're old. How's that going to work? Well, the angel says, it will work. I am an angel. I stand before the angel Gabriel. I stand before the presence of God. I'm speaking his word. And because you didn't believe me, you will be mute until your son is born. From that point on, Zechariah could not speak. Now, it doesn't say he was deaf. It says he was mute. And yet, in Luke, when Elizabeth becomes pregnant, she actually has a son. Now, Elizabeth was a relative of Mary's. Jesus and John the Baptist were cousins. We don't know first cousins, second cousins, because it doesn't give us the detail, but they were related. John the Baptist was six months older because Mary is pregnant. She goes to visit her cousin, her relative, Elizabeth, and Elizabeth says the, my, the baby in my womb, who is six months further along, leapt to have you here and your child, who is to be the Messiah. Okay? So we have this wonderful story. Elizabeth gives birth to a son, and they, the father can't speak, remember. Zachariah can't say anything. So they say to Elizabeth, okay, we're going to name the kid Zachariah after his father. And Elizabeth, who had had a vision from God, says, no, you're going to call him John. And they all say, John? There's nobody in your family named John. Because in those days, you always used a family name. You didn't just pick a name out of the air. You didn't name your kid you know, Zerubbabel Apple, or whatever the kind of names they use nowadays. Well, they said, but there's nobody in your family named John. And it says, verse 62 of Luke 1, Then they made signs to the father to find out what he would like to name the child. He couldn't talk. He could hear just fine, and yet they're going <laughs> like this. What do, you want to, you know, what do you want to name the kid? He asked for a writing tablet, and to everyone's astonishment, he wrote, His name is John. Immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue set free and he began to speak, praising God. All the neighbors were filled with awe and throughout the hill country of Judea people were talking about all these things. Everyone who heard this wondered about it, asking, what, what then is this child, that is John the Baptist, they didn't call him the Baptist at that point, but he was John the Baptist, what then is this child going to be? For the Lord's hand was with him. His father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied. And this is the song of Zechariah. Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come to his people and redeemed them. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he said through his holy prophets long ago. There it is again. The prophetic expectation of the Messiah. Salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show mercy to our ancestors and to remember his holy covenant, the oath he swore to our father Abraham, to rescue us from the hand of our enemies and to enable us to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all of our days. And you, my child, see all of that was about the Messiah who's coming. Now he turns to speak to his son. And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High. For you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of sins because of the tender mercy of our God by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the path of peace. 
This is the song of Zechariah. And then that passage ends in Luke 1.80 by saying, And the child grew and became strong in spirit, and he lived in the wilderness until he appeared publicly in Israel. This is John the Baptist. Prophetically ordained to be the forerunner, the one to prepare the way. Now when John comes along, he is called to preach a gospel of repentance. And he makes a huge splash. John the Baptist starts a revival. He starts a movement at the Jordan River so that Israelites from all over Israel were coming out to him to hear him preach. It had been 400 years since the last time there had been a prophet of God in Israel. Malachi was the last one. 400 years, and they're saying, where's the Messiah? Where's the voice of God? Who is it that speaks for God? Now John the Baptist comes along. He has all of the appearance of one of the Old Testament prophets. In fact, he is the last of the Old Testament prophets. He wears a hair shirt, a leather belt around his waist. He eats locusts and wild honey. You know, we're told that Elijah, for instance, and, and some of the other old prophets, uh, prophets of the Old Testament, wore uh, hair coats or particular kind of garments. In fact, they talk about, you've heard somebody talk about passing on the mantle, right? Elijah passed on his cloak, the cloak of the prophet, to his uh, successor, Elisha. And that's where the expression passing on the mantle was passing on the mantle of the prophet. Well, John dressed like a prophet. He ate weird stuff like a prophet. He lived out in the wilderness. This was a revival of spirituality. And we find in, um, in I think this is Luke, yeah, Luke 3, it says, John said to the crowds coming out to be baptized by him, because again, people were coming out. It was very fashionable to go out and hear this John, this crazy man in the wilderness. But people would come out and either, a lot of them may have come out for curiosity's sake, but they heard the preaching of John to, to confess your sins, repent of your sins, become righteous before God, and they listened. And a lot of them did. There was a spiritual revival happening. John said to the crowds coming out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers. That always gets your congregation right there with you. I'm going to have to try that. <laughs> you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with the repentance. Do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that one of these stones, that out of one of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. So, the religious leaders, there's all this spiritual revival is happening. These religious leaders go out to him and start asking him, Are you Elijah? No. Are you this? Are you that? Are you something else? And John always says, No, I am just a voice of one crying in the wilderness. He quotes the Old Testament. And he always says, But there is one coming after me whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. I baptize with water, but he who is coming will baptize with fire and the Holy Spirit. Well, and the crowd, again in Luke 3, says, What should we do then? The crowd asked. John answered, Anyone who has two shirts should share with the one who has none, and anyone who has food should do the same. Even tax collectors, who were the lowest, I mean, they were the worst of sinners. Even tax collectors came to be baptized. Teacher, they asked, what should we do? Don't collect any more than you're required to, he told them. Tax collectors were notorious for claiming, for demanding more than was due and then keeping the extra. <laughs> then some soldiers asked him, what should we do? He replied, don't extort money and don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. <laughs> <laughs> the people were waiting expectantly and were wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Messiah. John answered them all, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I will come, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear off the threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, and he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. And with many other words, John exhorted the people and proclaimed the good news to them. <laughs> now, Jesus uh, was witnessed to by John. John said there is another one coming. When Jesus appears to John, John testifies, Behold the Lamb of God. This is the one. 
that we've been waiting for. When John, later on, when his, his apostles say, well, you know, he's, he's preaching and he's doing all this stuff, John's response is, I must decrease that he might increase. John was the religious leader in the, in the country. He was the one who had the following. In fact, the people who were his disciples, John referred them to Jesus. The very first of Jesus' disciples had been disciples of John. Andrew, the brother of Peter. Nathaniel. They were John's disciples. And because John said, he's the one we've been waiting for, they started following Jesus. And then Andrew went and got his brother, Simon, who later was called Peter, and said, come, we have found the Messiah. That's how this whole thing got started. John witnessed to Jesus. Now, Jesus could have had several responses to John. One, he could have, you know, sort of brushed him off. Or he could have um, corrected him. If there's one fault that John had, it was that it was not so much good news as we would like Jesus even says later, you know, John the Baptist came and neither ate nor drank, and you criticized him for that. The Son of Man comes eating and drinking, and you criticized me for that. There was a clear distinction between the asceticism and the, you know, the pretty harsh judgment, repent, you know, repent of your sins or be burning in hell kind of thing that John preached. And it was effective, and it's what people needed to hear to straighten up. And then the gospel of love, the one who ate with tax collectors and sinners. That Jesus, the one who, yes, called people to a righteous life, but did it lovingly. I read a great little vignette. These two ministers at the end of the 19th century were talking to one another. And one of them asked the other one, said, well, what was your sermon topic last Sunday? And he said, my topic was, sinners will be cast into hell. And his friend paused for a minute and looked at him and said, and did you preach that with tenderness? <laughs> <laughs> you know, Sinners will be cast into hell was John's message. Jesus did not change that message, but he preached it with tenderness. And most especially, Jesus affirmed all that John the Baptist had been doing in preparing people, in, in shaking people awake about their sinfulness and their need to be right with God. He prepared them, and that's what his job was, for the message that would come in the Messiah. John the Baptist, as I say, I don't think we give him nearly enough credit. He was critically important to prepare in advance of the coming of Jesus so that people would be ready for that. Okay? Question? Come in. Okay, stretching. All right. Uh, John the Baptist then, because he didn't pull any punches with anybody, John the Baptist uh, was preaching on the Transjordan, east of the Jordan River, and that is part of the, the area known as Perea. The ruler of that area, as well as Galilee, was Herod Antipas, one of the sons of Herod the Great. Antipas had married his sister-in-law. Apparently, there's no indication they'd gotten a divorce. Uh, Herodias, her name was, had been married to Herod Philip, who's the, who's the nicest of all the Herod family. Nobody ever said anything bad about Herod Philip. Apparently, he was a really good ruler. Herodias had been married to him, and apparently she was impressed by power, and Herod Antipas, you know, Herod Philip's brother, seemed to be a, you know, a more manly kind of guy, and so she left her husband and you know, lived with him as his wife. And her daughter Salome was there. Well, Herod Antipas apparently was impressed with John the Baptist and, and offered him sort of, you know, you could be the, the official hellfire and brimstone preacher of the kingdom if you'd like. And yet, John was not impressed with Herod Antipas. And he started publicly condemning him for marrying his sister-in-law, which was a marriage that was against the Jewish law. And so Antipas is kind of, Ugh, what am I going to do with this? And his wife Herodias... Uh, wouldn't put up with it and said, you need to arrest him, Herod. So Herod arrests John the Baptist. Has him in prison, but won't do anything to him because maybe he's a little scared of him, maybe he's a little impressed with him, all of this. And then he has a big party, and you know the story. Herodias' daughter Salome dances so well that Herod in his cups says, that was so beautiful, I'll give you anything you want. Well, Salome checked with her mother Herodias, well, what should I ask him for? And Herodias says, tell him you want the head of John the Baptist on a platter. She wanted to get rid of this guy, who publicly was pointing out the fact they were living in sin. So John the Baptist is beheaded, and Jesus is greatly stricken by that. Uh, uh, when Jesus hears, we find out in the Gospels, that G John has been killed. He goes off by himself, sends the disciples, said, you, you guys going across the uh, Sea of Galilee, the lake on your own, I will catch up with you. Which he literally did. That was when he walked on water. 
Okay, he walked down on the water to catch up with him because he wanted some time alone to sort of recover from the news that John the Baptist had died. Jesus called John the Baptist the greatest person ever born of woman. Right? The greatest of all the prophets, he said. So very significant influence. We don't give John the Baptist enough credit, I don't think. Now, a particular thing that John the Baptist and Jesus, in terms of their interaction, Jesus goes to John the Baptist and says, you need to baptize me. And John the Baptist says, baptize you? You should baptize me. Because John, in the same way that Simeon and Anna were righteous people, and that righteousness God allowed them to recognize Jesus the baby as the Messiah, John the Baptist was a righteous man before God, and he, in the same way, was able to recognize Jesus as the Son of God as an adult. And so Jesus says, baptize me. John the Baptist says, what? You should baptize me. Jesus says, no, do this so that all righteousness can be fulfilled. John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. And some people have said, well, does this mean that Jesus needed to repent of some sins? The answer is no, he didn't. Um, Jesus was without sin. I believe the way we need to understand Jesus' baptism by John is that Jesus fully um, associated himself with our humanity. He fully um, connected with what it meant to be a human being. His baptism by John was not because he had sinned, but it was almost a prophetic acknowledgement that a time would come when he would take, three and a half years later, take upon himself the sins of the whole world and die on a cross for us. So the baptism was not because Jesus had sinned at that point, but it was to align and associate himself with our humanity and to acknowledge prophetically that a time would come when he would carry our sins, that he would have sinned, not because he'd done committed sins, but because he took our sins upon him. And so there's a great deal of significance in the fact that he insisted on being baptized so that all righteousness could be fulfilled. And then, the last thing I want to talk about today is the temptation in the wilderness. Um, and let me see. Ross, I got, I got a question, real okay. quick question while you're looking at What is it in point six? What is that? Is it death of John the Baptist? Macarus? Oh, Macar uh, Macarus. That was the city in Perea where he was held. It was a fortress city okay. of um, Paradise Spots, and that was the city where he was being held and where he was killed. And so it took a little while for the word to get up to Galilee, which is where Jesus was when he heard about it. Okay? That's, yeah, it's a fortress city. Um, this passage, which is in Matthew 4, immediately after being baptized, immediately Jesus is called into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit. And this is the passage. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to a holy, the holy city, Jerusalem, and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, Throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command His angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. Jesus answered him, It is also written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and angels came and attended him. I want to make a couple comments about this, and then we'll, we'll stop for today. Um, one, you will notice that Satan's temptations involve, first of all, questioning, as he did with Eve, you know, what did God really say? In this case, well, if you are the Son of God, creating that question, Jesus didn't fall for it, Eve did. Jesus didn't fall for it, but there's always that question, well, if it is true, it's also to be noted that, at least in the second temptation, that the devil quotes Scripture. The devil can twist Scripture to his own ends. Just because somebody quotes Scripture does not mean they are speaking for God. The devil himself can do that. Um, but Jesus always responds with Scripture appropriately. In each of the three cases, you know, I've, I've highlighted the temptation, but in each case, Jesus answered, It is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Uh, it is written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. It is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. He is quoting the Old Testament. Jesus responds to the temptations of the devil by quoting the word of God. 
which is a lesson we should learn. Okay? A critically important lesson. But the thing I find most fascinating about the three temptations of that, that Satan gave Jesus is that all three of them were things that Jesus wanted. All three of them were good things. The first one was, turn stones into bread so that you can feed hungry people. A lot of what Jesus did, some of his most spectacular miracles were feeding hungry people. You know, the loaves and fishes, for instance. There's not anything inherently wrong with coming up with a way to feed hungry people. The second one had to do with throwing yourself down and therefore demonstrating yourself to be the Son of God. Because if you're the Son of God, the angels themselves will protect you. God won't let you be harmed. Well, Jesus wanted people to know he was the Son of God. That's why he came. That was core to his being the Savior, is for people to recognize him as the Son of God. And the third thing was to have authority over all the kingdoms of the world and you know to, to be the ruler of all creation. Well, that is what Jesus is for. I mean, he created everything. Through him all things were made, and without him nothing was made that has been made, John 1. And eventually he is to be the ruler over everything. Every knee shall bow, every tongue confess Jesus Christ is Lord. All three of these things, feeding hungry people, being acknowledged as the Son of God in power, having authority over all the kingdoms of the earth and all of creation, all three were things that Jesus wanted to accomplish, and eventually will accomplish. And yet, this is a perfect example to me that the ends do not justify the means. It's possible to want the right thing and to try to get it in the wrong way. In each case, the devil was offering shortcuts that would not ultimately be honoring to God. The most obvious one of those is the devil, who is the ruler of this world, we are told in Scripture, offers to allow Jesus, if Jesus will worship the devil, allow Jesus to go ahead and shortcut, get there quick, and be the ruler over all the kingdoms of the earth. No, that's not how to get there, even though that's what's going to happen eventually. A lot of things had to happen before that. You know, turning stones into bread... The problem there is that everybody's more worried about the bread than they are the one who did the work. This was a problem Jesus had in his ministry, is he would preach to people. They didn't want to hear him preach. They wanted to see miracles. They wanted him to heal them or, or drive out demons. You know, everybody, lengthen my leg. You know, make me taller. I, I'd like to have hair, thank you. Whatever it was, that's what they were focusing on. Jesus struggled to get them to, to stop demanding healings or miracles and listen to the message. So just giving them bread was not the whole point. If they acknowledged that he was the Son of God because he did some giant magic trick, rather than believing that God the Father had sent his Son because he loves us, and he wants us to be in relationship with him, that wouldn't get us where we wanted to go. The ends do not justify the means. Don't ever get tricked into believing that. It's a lie from the pit of hell, and this is a perfect example. The ultimate results of all three of these will be achieved. The hungry will be fed. The Son of God will be revealed in power. And Jesus, the Son of God, will be the ruler over all of the kingdoms of all the earth. All of those things will eventually happen. But they'll happen the right way, not the wrong way. Okay? Critical messages in there. This is the wilderness is something we the wilderness temptation we sort of skip over without realizing that this is for us. There's a reason why all four gospels contain this. Any questions or comments about any of that? Anything?